portray a daughter of Charity Nunn from Emmitsburg. Um, it's a little known part of Civil War history that after the Battle of Gettysburg, 11 nuns and one priest came up from Emmitsburg, Maryland to nurse the soldiers back to health after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so last year at the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, I debuted my Daughters of Charity impression. Um, as you can imagine, I was the only nun walking around the Battle of Gettysburg that weekend. Um, but it's something that I think more people need to know about, and it's, you know, women's history is especially close to my heart. Um, when I am reenacting with the 87th, I portray a soldier, so I am a woman disguised as a man. Um, over 400 women did disguise themselves as male soldiers during the Civil War, and we have evidence of this after Pickett's charge. They found dead women on both sides, the Confederate and the Union, uh, women that went in disguise and portrayed soldiers. Um, so today I'm going to focus on the history of the Daughters of Charity, the Sisters of Charity here in the United States, and I'm just going to touch on some of the roles that women played during the Civil War. Um, to start, as you can see from my outfit and my little porcelain doll here, I got her on eBay. Uh, this is what a Daughters of Charity nun looked like. So as you can see, we wear dark blue. I have a skirt and I have a jacket. I have a linen shirt underneath. And then I have a collar, just like this girl does. And then I have a blue apron that goes underneath. And then instead of carrying around a rosary, I have one on my hip. And she does as well. And then you have the famous coronet. So when people think of the daughters or the sisters of charity, they think of the famous flying nun. So I got that joke a lot wearing this. Um, the reason that they had coronets like this is because when the daughters of charity started, they started in France. And they were founded in 1633 by Vincent de Paul, and he founded the daughters of charity in Paris. And the reason that they wore the coronets and the reason they look like this is because this is what your average peasant woman in Paris, France looked like in 1633. So you're looking at this and you're saying, so women walked around with giant flying nun habits. Yes, they did. <laughs> this is what they wore when they were plowing fields, walking through the streets and working. The Daughters of Charity were a religious organization that was founded to be charitable. They wanted to help the poor. They wanted to help orphans. What better way to do that than to assimilate into that society and not stand out? You wanted to put yourself on an even playing field with the people. You wanted to make them feel comfortable. So you dress like them and you live like they do. So nuns take a vow of chastity and poverty. They were not allowed to join the religious order with any of their own items. You can't have any debt. You come in owning no worldly possessions except for your religious wear and a few other things, maybe a Bible, you might have to come in with your own um, set of plates and um, silverware, those sort of things back then they would require you to have, but you couldn't own property, you couldn't have debt, so they did take their vow of poverty very seriously, and they earned their food and their keep through helping others. So again, they dressed like the peasants of France dressed. And then Elizabeth Ann Seton founded the Sisters of Charity, the Daughters of Charity, in Emmitsburg, Maryland in 1809. And she modeled her Sisters of Charity after the Daughters of Charity. Now, at that time, they weren't one group. So she differentiated by calling them the Sisters of Charity. Later on, they did form up with the Daughters of Charity that were in Europe, and now they're under the umbrella of Daughters of Charity. But um, she modeled it after the sisters in France. She was known for opening the first um, Catholic girls' school in America, and she really paved the way for the Daughters of Charity in America. They are now throughout America. Um, New York had a lot of them helping with the poor in the tenements. And if you've watched the movie Cabrini that came out recently about a Catholic saint, she really went in and showed the devastation that was happening in these tenement apartments and the immigration population in New York at the time. Um, there was a lot of disease, a lot of poverty, and a lot of orphans. So back then, you didn't really have the government um, associations that you do now. You didn't have social security, you didn't have welfare. So if you were an orphan or you were poor and destitute, you had to look to religious organizations for help. So um, organizations like the Sisters of Charity really stepped up and they provided those services for the people. So more than 
230 daughters of charity served as nurses during the Civil War, and more than 650 uh, Catholic nuns in different orders throughout America served as nurses during the Civil War. Um, at the time of the Civil War, there was a resounding anti-Catholic sentiment. It was very pro-Protestant. Um, so the sisters really had to prove their might and show that they were capable of the job. Dorothea Dix, a famous uh, Civil War nurse, did not want the Catholic nuns involved in nursing, um, but desperate times call for desperate measures. The doctors and the surgeons said, hey, we just don't have enough bodies um, to care for these wounded and dying men. We need help. The Sisters of Charity already had experience working with sick people um, on the streets, in hospitals. They were already nursing on a smaller level. Why not bring that experience into Civil War hospitals? So during the Civil War, Evansburg provided one-third of the Catholic nuns that served as nurses. So one-third of those women that were going out nursing came from Emmitsburg, Maryland, and Elizabeth Ann Seaton's school. So on June 27, 1863, the sisters at Emmitsburg watched as the Army of the Potomac's third corps part of it moved through town. And they were camping right outside of the, um, the uh, school and the religious um, church and everything that was there, the convent. So the sisters went out and they ended up supplying the soldiers with bread, butter, and coffee. And for a lot of those soldiers, that was probably the last meal that they ate, their last proper home-cooked meal that they ate. Because again, the Sisters of Charity, they're providing charity for the soldiers. So they saw men in need, they were hungry, they were tired, they had marched, um, and they knew that they were probably going into battle. They watched the Confederates come through. Now they didn't supply the Confederates <laughs> with food and water, but they did with the federal troops. And the nuns could actually hear the cannon fire in Emmitsburg as it was happening. I mean, the battle was so large and there were so many cannons that they could hear it uh, in Emmitsburg during the battle. But it wasn't until the battle ended and July 5th, Father Francis Berlando gathered a group of nuns and he traveled with them to Gettysburg. Initially, he traveled with 11 nuns and then the number ended up reaching 16. Because Emmitsburg was so close in proximity to Gettysburg, they were able to switch out shifts. So one uh, nun could come up maybe for a week, maybe she got tired, maybe she just couldn't deal with it, or maybe she got sick herself. They would send her back to the convent and they would switch her out with another nun, or maybe they just needed more hands on deck. So you could switch out. You could also get supplies very easily from the convent to the hospitals in Gettysburg. So as they were coming up from um, Emmitsburg to Gettysburg, they rode in what's called an omnibus. So it's a little bit bigger version of a wagon. Uh, you know, these people weren't driving their automobiles, so it took them a lot longer than it would take us to get from Evansburg to Gettysburg. So, and he recalls, and this is a quote, houses burnt, dead bodies of both armies strewn here and there, an immense number of slain horses, thousands of bayonets, sabers, wagons, wheels, projectiles of all dimensions, blankets, caps, clothing of every color covered the woods and the fields. Our terrified horses drew back or darted forward, reeling from one side to the other. So you can imagine that these women lived a very sheltered life. Yes, they went out into the community and they helped the poor, but most people had not seen war up close. And a lot of people think of the human toll of war, yes, but the animals that were killed during the war. After the Battle of Gettysburg, there was livestock laying in the streets and on the farms. There was horses everywhere. They were getting bloated and sort of exploding in the heat. There was dead bodies bloating on the side of the road. You go into these situations and you do triage. So you're helping the most critical cases first. If you see a gentleman laying there and you think you can save him, you immediately take him to the field hospital and do what you can do. If someone's laying there and they don't need immediate attention, you're going to leave them on the battlefield. Some of these men could lay there for days. Um, they needed water and they needed medical care, but you had to take the most injured first and you had to take the people that you could save. Um, they didn't have the resources to save everyone, so sometimes there was heartbreaking decisions to say, this person's too far gone, we don't think they're going to survive an amputation, we don't think there's anything we can do for them. And unfortunately, those people were just left to sort of perish on the battlefield. 
Um, the nuns ended up setting up in St. Francis Xavier Roman Catholic Church on High Street, and that is still there today. And you can see a plaque that was erected for the Sisters of Charity, the Daughters of Charity, for their work in Gettysburg. The nurses, uh, they helped the wounded. They ended up baptizing the dying. They combed lice off of the soldiers. A lot of them contracted lice themselves. They cleaned maggots out of infected wounds because you have to remember these men were laying on the battlefield for days at a time. The nurses didn't even get there until July 5th and 6th. So you can imagine how many days the battle ended on July 3rd. You're laying there and you have an open wound. The flies are gonna get you, maggots are gonna be in your wounds. And they used maggots to debris wounds, which they still do today. If you have a wound that um, is very full of infection and dirt and things, they clean it out as much as they can. But if there's dead tissue in there, they will put maggots on you in a hospital, leeches. So those things were also used during the Civil War. They would help write letters. They would feed the injured and the sick soldiers. They prayed with them and they play games with them to keep up uh, the morale and keep them occupied. Because when you're just convalescing in a field hospital, um, there's really not much to do but lay there and hope you survive. The wounded uh, were scattered around the church. So at the time they laid them on the pews, underneath the pews, and then they laid boards across the pews to sort of make makeshift beds. And I have some uh, other things here about a very famous case there were two biological sisters that were nuns, uh, daughters of charity out of Emmitsburg, and they were sisters Veronica and Serena Klemensky. And in addition to caring for wounded soldiers, they and the other uh, sisters were responsible for searching the battlefield for those that were still living and those that were dead. If they found someone that was still living, they would try and take them to a field hospital. And if they were dead, they would mark them for burial. On one of the occasions when these two sisters were sent out into the battlefield, they ended up finding a soldier um, on Culp's Hill and his face was covered in blood and he was crying out for water because everyone had a canteen. But during battle, this could fall off, you could lose it. And if you're injured and laying there dying for a few days, you're gonna drink all of this water. It's not gonna stay in here for four or five days. So they found this gentleman laying there and when the sisters wiped the blood off his face, they discovered that it was their biological brother. So they come all the way from Emmitsburg, Maryland. Who knows the last time that they saw him because they were living a life in a convent. He was off to war. He could have been anywhere in the country for all they knew. You know, when's the last time they received a letter? They come there on hospital detail to look for people that might still be injured. They find their brother. So, um... His name was Thaddeus, and he was a private in the 1st Maryland Battalion, a Confederate regiment that would later become known as the 2nd Maryland. He had been badly wounded attacking the Union's positions on Culp's Hill. Sister Serena was able to nurse her brother back to health, and he ended up surviving the war. And both sisters ended up surviving the war also. So, you know, that's just an amazing testament. I don't know about you, I am a practicing Catholic in real life, even though I only play none on the weekend. But I feel like that was divine intervention to have these two sisters go out and find their biological brother on the battlefield. And if you go to St. Francis Xavier's church today, you will find not only a plaque installed in front of the church, but you'll find a stained glass window that depicts the sisters working as nurses. And they really did become wonderful nurses. They already had the experience of helping the poor and the orphans. So it was natural for them to be able to go in and nurse. You have to remember that there was no medicine or germ theory during the Civil War. So a lot of these nurses would end up being sick themselves. They'd contract diseases from the people that they were nursing. They could nick themselves with a dirty blade that was used in the hospital and get infected. They had lice and ticks and anything that you could pick up on the battlefield. And the food wasn't that great. People were excited sometimes to go to the field hospital because you could get canned food. But there was no pasteurization back then. So when you opened up your can, there's usually maggots on top. And you'd scrape that off and then you'd get to the good stuff. So extra protein. But you know, you were pretty much, um, a better bet was to find fresh food or have fresh food delivered to the hospital. So, you know, you're thinking about bread, salt pork, vegetables from local farms, coffee different things like that. So 
you know, these sisters were really under the same conditions that the soldiers were under. It wasn't glamorous. They didn't get home at the end of the day and lay on a feather bed. They were living, eating, and sleeping in the church with these men. And they ended up staying for about six months. So, you know, in that six months, these 16 nurses, nuns, really ended up, um, you know, going back and forth from the convent to the hospital, really doing all of this. And they had to do it in this outfit. So you can imagine your perfectly starched coronet starting to weep in the humidity and the wind and you have blood splatter on you. But they were just trying to remain, uh, remain as professional as possible and nurse these gentlemen back to health and offer um, some religious guidance. But I also brought with me today um, some resources that you can go out and get if you're interested. It's called Battlefield Angels, the Daughters of Charity Work as Civil War Nurses. So this talks about not only Gettysburg, but just the Civil War as a whole and going to all of the different battlefields and across the country. Like I said, there were 650 uh, Catholic nuns that served as nurses during the war. Another great book, um, White Wings of Mercy, The Coronet of the Daughters of Charity. And then the best one that I found is the habit a history of the clothing of catholic nuns so this goes through um, the advent of catholic nuns and what they wore until now and you'll notice that if you ever go to emmitsburg and you find a daughter of charity walking around they're not dressed like this anymore so vatican ii happened and it was decreed by the church that nuns were going to look more like you were a modern day person. They were going to assimilate into society, just like the nuns in the 1600s wanted to dress the way society was dressing. Nuns today are dressing the way society is dressing. So they got rid of the coronets and they have more of the veils, the habit that we call them, or they don't even wear a head covering at all. Usually you can tell that it's a Catholic nun by the fact that they usually wear a plain skirt, a white top, and a cardigan or a sweater. And then they always have um, a rosary with them or a Bible, something denoting their religious work. Um, but a lot of nuns today don't even wear a head covering. It depends on what order you're in, and it's not a requirement. Um, usually the convent that you're with, the order that you're with, will decree what you have to wear. Um, before photographs were common, they would send little dolls like this around to the convents to show you how your nuns should dress, or they'd send drawings, they'd send little fabric samples, and it told you exactly what each nun should look like. Um, the nuns down at Elizabeth E.M. <laughs> Seaton had these really neat uh, metal templates made, and you'd lay them down, and that's how you would iron your coronet to get it perfectly. Because you can see my coronet does not look like this woman's coronet. I don't have that little template at home. I have some spray starch and an iron. I did my best. <laughs> it's not perfect. You know, I'm not going to be in a documentary anytime soon looking exactly like this. Um, but these women, every single morning, would wake up and they'd get out that metal template and they would starch these coronets. I don't even think a bullet could go through there. They had them so stiff. And they would wear those. And it didn't matter if they were out in the wind, the rain, the high heat, if they were nursing soldiers or feeding the poor. They also starched their collars on a metal template, and you can go and you can see that these items are still preserved in their museum. And you can go through and they have a video, they found a nun um, that was alive during the time that they wore these outfits before Vatican II. And she was kind enough to have a video filmed of her showing you how they folded and starched and ironed these coronets. And let me tell you, it was a process. This isn't something that was completed in five minutes. It was really a process and the amount of pins that she used and the different ways she had to stop and go back and repin until it was perfect. They really, you know, took it seriously. They wanted to present themselves as professional um, and really show up and show you what they were supposed to look like. But the jobs of nurses, you know, it's something that we talk about, but I think the religious aspect of it is also very important. And especially with the anti-Catholic sentiment during the Civil War, it's important not to forget that the Catholic nuns really did play a pivotal role in nursing and helping, uh, you know, not only orphans and the poor in Emmitsburg, but they also went out of their way to go across the country and help out after battles during the Civil War. So that is my presentation.